everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Joe Diamond. I head of Okta's security business on the product team, um, which means I spend a lot of my time thinking about what it is that we're going to build and how it is that we're going to deliver success uh, to our customers. Um, as you all know, Okta is, is very oriented to ensuring that our customers are successful and we partner very closely um, with our professional services organization. And uh, Dave Fend is joining us today to talk about what the work that he does to ensure that our customers are successful, um, having successful deployments, uh, solving uh, challenges and pain that they're trying to rectify from a security point of view, which includes everything that we do from an adaptive uh, MFA point of view as well. Um, so with that, uh, Dave Fenn. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Joe. Glad to be here. Awesome, awesome. So uh, what would you say, I know you have a very long tenured background in the identity and access management space. Uh, what would you say really kind of brings your skills and your expertise to fruition when you're thinking about adaptive MFA? Yeah, so I've been uh, working in the identity and access management industry for probably about the last 17 years now, really pretty much all cloud-based type implementations. And I've had the pleasure of uh, working in uh, roles in engineering, product management, and uh, now in uh, professional services. And so during that time, I've been able to define, design, and now work with customers to implement their multi-factor implementations for really millions of identities uh, in place around the world today. Yeah, I mean, that's a great background. And 17 years is a, obviously a very long time and things have changed quite a bit, not in the last, just last 17 years, but also in the last, say, five or six. What, what do you think some of the biggest changes are in, you know, in recent time? Uh, really, the, the, some of the biggest changes that are pushed to be uh, much more, uh, I would say, API focused, right? Um, the, the push to add for much more flexible customization, lightweight microservice type implementations um, right down to those uh, fine grain control levels. Yeah, that makes sense. And obviously, you know, as organizations are shifting more toward a, a cloud-based model, the willingness to adopt cloud applications is obviously uh, increasing drastically, <laughs> wouldn't you say? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, you know, back in the day, it used to be kind of an argument on uh, whether they were going to use cloud or not going to use cloud, whether cloud yep. was secure or not. And it's no longer a question of uh, if they're going to, it's a question of when they're going to. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I remember not that long ago, if you think about, you know, Microsoft's transition from uh, BPOS to Office 365 as an example, uh, you know, say five years ago, people were saying, oh, yeah, Office 365, the only people that are going to adopt Office 365 are going to be, you know, 500, 600 seat organizations. And now you see the biggest companies in the world going down that path. So clearly, the, you know, the, 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 the landscape has changed, the willingness to adopt cloud solutions um, has changed. And I think people are also cognizant of the fact that, hey, look, like the amount of expertise that people have in securing their platforms from a, from a cloud platform point of view, these vendors are generally gonna have more expertise in house than you do on your team trying to secure this stuff on premises yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like what do you do outside of work? Uh, like what, what do you do to keep your mind sharp? Obviously you're a, a technology aficionado, but what, what else keeps you going? You know, at home, I, I'm a bit of a technology nerd and I love playing with technology in my house. It's a good way to keep up with what I'm doing at work as well and, and kind of seeing those real life challenges. And so recently I've taken on this whole smart home initiative where I'm uh, starting to enable the, the things in my house with their own identities and trying to provide increased security and convenience to my own family. All right, you're right. So you're putting microphones on everything and <laughs> and having everything in your house listen to you. And hopefully those microphones uh, aren't turning on at inopportune times, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's uh, it's definitely a challenge, but I, I, it gives me an opportunity to to let my boys see uh, some of what I do at work in action and ask them questions and kind of explore, you know, hands on themselves. So. Totally, totally. And it's a, it's a pretty big opportunity. Uh, it, it makes it really clear the future that we're going to see in terms of you know, Internet of Things security, API access management security, et cetera, just API security in general, like all of these things are kind of like at the forefront. You know, it's like the yesteryear was all about, you know, how are we going to get to the cloud? How are we going to secure cloud applications? How are we going to connect these cloud applications? That's pretty mainstream now. We still got a ways to go. But clearly IoT and things like API access management are going to be the way of the future. Oh, absolutely. I was, uh, you know, I, I had uh, went out and bought my own little smart things hub and was trying to connect uh, a couple different things in my house to get my Alexa talking to my nest. And uh, 
and my new uh, smart door locks. And uh, next thing I knew, I was enabling uh, my smart hub to talk to my Nest uh, with programmatic OAuth APIs. And uh, <laughs> exactly, that's our that's our lives. And I think uh, you know things will get simpler over time. So you know, your average consumers can like actually tap into the benefits of, of these technologies. But it's the folks like you and I and, and, and our listeners that are thinking about like how, what is the intersection of security. Uh, with with these devices and what are the implications and you have to think about the security ramifications of what you're doing even when you're doing your own house right everyone you know with, with the smart door locks you immediately jump to thinking that uh, oh yeah it'd be great if I could tell Alexa to uh, lock my door and then you have to stop and pause and think would it be great to ask her to unlock the door do you really want somebody that's standing outside your house to be able to scream real loud and get your door unlocked yeah absolutely absolutely so, so shifting gears a little bit, uh, Dave, uh, you've been at Okta for a little bit of time. And as we talked about, you have a pretty long tenure in the space. What, what do you like working about Okta? What has your experience been like? You know, it's been really great and rewarding working at Okta. Um, it, it, when I went uh, looking for my next career opportunity, you know, I had to kind of give pause and think about what is it that I really enjoyed and and uh, identity management is definitely at the top of my mind. And being able to find a company where I could come to that was truly committed to the success of the other customers um, and to be able to apply that experience and passion that I had to go work at large enterprises and help make them successful has been really rewarding for me. Yeah, I, I think we, we all, you know, cross-functionally across our, you know, our entire company live and breathe uh, this notion. And, you know, uh, obviously we're going to continue doing that in the future. Um, one of the things that I'm sure you've seen as a part of your implementations, your designs, uh, your deployments is, you know, uh, kind of like a changing landscape just in general about some of the key obstacles and issues um, that customers are, are facing. And especially as it's changed over time, right? So going from kind of legacy on-premises design principles to kind of uh, dealing with uh, hybrid environments and whatnot, what would you say are the key obstacles that you're seeing customers face today? Yeah, I think there's really two big ones that are um, recurring on the landscape today that pretty much every company I'm going into um, is facing. And, you know, the first one we've kind of touched on a little bit, which is that cloud architecture in the digital age where everybody's moving to the cloud. They're trying to find ways to get all of their legacy on-premise systems uh, into the cloud. And, and every company is really becoming a digital company. And as part of becoming a digital company, you end up with a lot of identities to manage. Um, the second one is really the, you know, the fact that the identity is becoming the new perimeter. Um, you know, organizations can't count anymore on IT securing the perimeter. They need to have a zero trust network and they're being required to give access to their partners, suppliers, customers, systems, data that they protect um, pretty much on any device at any time. And uh, this is where, you know, someone rocked it with a strong identity program can come in and it's really the key to protect that network and the access to the sensitive data. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And then moreover, I think a lot of organizations are just embracing this idea that the, this, this concept of, you know, network security and like relying on, on the firewall uh, as the perimeter is a little bit of a, almost a flawed uh, perspective at this point, at least to some degree, right? Because generally speaking, um, you know, in larger organizations, IT might have pretty good controls in place in terms of, you know, having uh, really good control over endpoints and maybe the networks that people are allowed to work on. But uh, for cloud first and mobile first organizations, those rules are starting to change quite a bit. You know, as you move into, you know, bring your own everything, um, you know, they don't necessarily have great control over the endpoint, over the network that people are, uh, you know, doing business on, over the applications that they even use. And obviously, the kind of you know, uprising, if you will, of this shadow IT motion. So, I mean, all of these rules feel like they're kind of in front of changing. They, they are, and, and the mindsets have to change too, right? The, the rules were there really more to, uh, to not allow in versus uh, um, to allow access to anything. And so, you know, even though a good uh, friend of mine is a chief security officer, always said the most secure system is a down system. Um, that's not really the, uh, the most effective way to do business today. So um, you have to share if to be successful. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's a big part of this 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 whole idea that you have to view identity as that choke point, as that control point that you're moving toward in the future, because that's really the one of the only paths that you can actually 
uh, maintain strict control over and you can control access obviously to all the services and applications that you use and you know ensure that they can only be accessed through that control point and that's obviously the triggering control point for integration with other downstream applications as part of your broader security ecosystem you know being able to identify a account compromise respond to that account compromise etc you you kind of have to view authentication and authorization as that control point in order to be successful in the future Okay, so with that, um, what, what would you what would you say are some of the key points that that, that Okta is really solving for, uh, for? You know, for a lot of our customers, uh, what are you seeing people gravitate toward uh, the most, and where are you seeing kind of the most value being extracted? You know, I tend to work on the the larger enterprise type use cases for Okta, and so I'm seeing a lot of initiatives with companies that have their legacy and infrastructure in place and. Uh, you know, given that Okta is born in the cloud, built in the cloud for the cloud type identity provider, we're really a great way to enable them to move their legacy systems to the cloud and uh, enable them to integrate across their clouds with just a single sign-on. Um, and then on top of that, to those you know security vectors that we were talking about, different control points, we have our adaptive multi-factor authentication that we can add in to, to add that required security. Um, it's really that next level of security um, to protect against password breaches and uh, to be able to implement a non-intrusive way, looking at the different signals in the background and, and prompting users only when um, something appears suspicious. Right, that makes sense. So are you seeing any specific trends in terms of the types of attacks that, that our customers are, are most concerned about or have top of mind that they're looking you know, to really push forward, not only an identity initiative, but an adaptive MFA initiative as well? Yeah, so they're uh, you know they're trying to protect different types of uh, access points, and you know whether it be the remote user trying to get in through a VPN or um, just access to critical data that they have that uh, they need to be you know cognizant of losing like your Coca Cola recipe or what have you, um, right. and ultimately. When you're looking at it, they're recognizing that uh, passwords are weak. Password, passwords are, are um, easy to compromise. Uh, there, there's just too many different attack vectors on them. And so they need to be able to look at uh, that user sign on, that user access to something that's sensitive and be able to provide a much more trusted framework doing that. And that's where you know, multi-factor authentication can really come in to help out there. So that it gives you a little bit more assurance that uh, that person who's accessing that sensitive data at that time is really who they say they are. Right, right. The identity assurance aspect of this is, is clearly pretty critical. And you know, one of the interesting, interesting things all up is that, as you know, being a, a veteran in this industry is like, we, we've gone from a place in which using something like MFA is, is kind of like seen almost as a compliance checkbox, where as like now it's pretty much a ubiquitous security best practice. Uh, what, what did you say customers are realizing that as well? Yeah, it's more and more customers are um, definitely looking to, to implement it that uh, it's, it's they're not necessarily doing it because they have to do it. They're doing it because they, they realize that this, this needs to happen. Right. Right. Clearly, clearly best practice. And, and, and you know, I, I think that's obviously a very positive step forward. Um, when you're thinking about in, engaging in a, in a strategy conversation uh, with a customer that's trying to figure out like, what are, what are the pains that they're actually uh, trying to solve? What are the key questions that you're asking or thinking about, you know, as you engage in that strategy conversation with the customer and they're trying to solve specific uh, pain points. Yeah. So, you know, the, the fir very first thing I like to understand when I uh, get engaged with the customer is what are their key pain points and what are their critical dates. And, uh, you know, you, you want to look to align together um, to make sure that you're putting a plan in that uh, is going to align with, with the business needs. Um, there's many ways to skin a cat, but if you don't get it done on time, you didn't go about it correctly. So, uh, what I find is that sometimes you need to get in, you need to get a smaller win in place. And uh, when you do that and you can hit a key deadline, then you can kind of move on to a bigger project, a bigger phase of the, the implementation um, and, and roll it out to, to align not just with what their IT needs, but with the business needs. Yeah, going into a customer engagement with a firm playbook probably isn't a great idea, right? It's, you know, every, every deployment is going to be, you know, completely unique from the next. 
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that, that's kind of that is one of the challenges that come in. Everyone wants to say, "Well, how did you do this for someone else?" And I'm like, exactly. "Okay, I, I have I have that. I can use that experience to help make you successful." Absolutely, but we'll probably end up doing something uh, a little different for you based on what you need. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't want to, I don't want to put you in a situation where you feel like you have to name drop. So we don't have to go down that path, but maybe you can provide uh, and talk about a customer, a couple of examples um, where you've helped a customer in the past. A uh, large enterprise that uh, I worked with, they had a security team that had identified that they wanted to bring in additional security code trolls, uh, really three classes of applications. One was remote access, another was access to privileged applications, and the third was uh, access to applications that provided sensitive data. Um, they decided they wanted MFA that, to protect these critical access points. Um, they had really decided that they had really liked Octus offering, but they weren't ready to just take on a full like tenancy management project for their employees because they had this massive on-premise site miner implementation over 150 different applications that were uh, installed and, and and configured and integrated for, with different customer teams out there. Um, so, you know, we had to get together and we had to kind of explore ways to, to make this happen for them. Um, and so we did one of these workshops with them. Um, we kind of, you know, looked at what their timelines were. They wanted something quick, but uh, they also had additional criteria. They had no change to existing user experience, no change required by any of their applications that they had. Um, and they needed a seamless integration with their current login experience. So after kind of exploring it with them, we kind of came up with this pattern where we could allow them to leverage that existing login that they had implemented on top of SiteMinder um, and then have it do a redirect to Okta um, through an SSO, uh, have Okta apply its multi-factor authentication uh, routines and challenges there, and then uh, when done, send it back to SiteMinder uh, through yet another SSO, but this time back to that application with sensitive data they're trying to access with the higher level of protection in place. Um, you know, we were able to roll that out uh, in a couple months um, with this hybrid implementation. It was very successful. And we're now working on that larger project to completely replace SiteMinder there with a modern cloud-based identity architecture. That makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, I think I, one of the other things that jumps out at me as you went through your answer there is time to value seems to be a huge piece of what customers are actually looking for out of their identity solutions. I mean, especially comparing to the, you know, the yesteryear of legacy architecture, legacy design, but what, what would you, what would you say to that? Are, are you seeing a lot of customers and, and getting a lot of implementations uh, and designs kind of just like done, rolled out, implemented in relatively quick order? Um, and how much has that changed, uh, you know, in the, in the last several years? Yeah, it's, it's changed a lot. And, you know, in this case you have the MFA team kind of, or really as the security team kind of leading the way saying, no, we're going to mandate this control and it's going to come out of our budget um, and we need this done quick. Um, and so that's where you had the time to value because they had, had uh, some uh, specific challenges that were going to be coming forward that, that kind of forced them to get this done in, in, a, in a shorter time frame. But uh, with different business units that are in place here where you had a completely separate identity team, from that security team, you also had kind of to balance those weights where the you know the identity team couldn't do this for them, and uh, but they were able to come to Okta and, and uh, have us work with their identity team to put that in place. That's great. What what, what are you seeing in terms of CIO and CISO engagement um, on the identity side? Historically, it's kind of been viewed as perhaps more of like an IT centric problem, but I feel like I'm seeing more of a trend to more CISO, more security team involvement. Is that something that, that you've been seeing in recent time as a part of your implementations um, uh, as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the CISO is more and more having a seat at the table. Um, they used to just kind of more be influencers and uh, the last couple of largest implementations, not only were they not just an influencer, but uh, they had the budget and they were, they were the decider. They, they were the ones that uh, sponsored and brought us into the, to this. So, um, and I think going forward, you, you're going to see that more and more with, with large enterprises. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Again, I think that's that's all part of the best practice uh, aspect of this, I think, um, and that security teams are, are cognizant of the fact that this has to be viewed as the best practice. And like you said, that you feel like you're kind of running into situations in which the security teams are not just having a seat at the table, but they're actually in many cases mandating it as requirements and it being a, a project that might even be funded by their budgets, et cetera. And it, we're also heading down this, this, this other path in which legal 
HR, business owners, like they're all getting involved in these projects too. Are you seeing those uh, transitions as well? Yeah, yeah. The uh, the, you know, the legal teams are are definitely getting engaged as well. Um, it's it's really kind of you have to have these whole um, executive uh, tables, if you will, with the different participants. Um, Legals kind of making their decisions on a lot of, uh, particularly for the multinational companies, when you start getting into like European deployments and GDPR requirements and things like that, and whether or not the security is uh, hitting those and, and compliance and regulations as well. So it's uh, it's really everybody has to work together to, to bring about the, the best solution for the company. Yeah, I think so. I think so too. What would you say are some of the programmatic issues that you're seeing uh, with deployments and what are the, some of the things that we're doing to maybe rectify some of those issues and accelerate some of those deployments? Yeah. So, you know, some of the, the programmatic issues that, that uh, we hit um, are around uh, branding um, per se specifically. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, when you're dealing with a, uh, customer use cases, you know, consumer use cases, and, and the brand means everything to the company. They want to make sure that uh, that they're exposing their brand. They're not exposing their partner's brand to the table. Um, and that's what their end users are seeing. And so that's where, you know, a solution like Okta that's fully API enabled is really, you know, great for them. Um, they're able to integrate their um, MFA solutions directly into their products. They're able to partner with a company like Okta, but they're able to put their own brand forward and, and do that. Um, and they're able to integrate all aspects of our, of our API offering, do, or MFA offering doing that, you know, the enrollment, uh, the enforcement, the policy decision points, as well as those adapt, adaptive based decisions. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely have no shortage of a really flexible platform with some, you know, really solid documented APIs that pretty much I would say like our customers can do virtually anything with or accomplish, you know, kind of any, any integration with, it's just a matter of how far you want to take the platform and how far you want to take the APIs. Absolutely. I mean, Act has been a, you know, API first uh, mentality company. So pretty much any functionality that anybody wanted to go into and, and configure within our admin dashboard, they could completely do on their own using our API. So it's a, it's a real powerful solution from that aspect. Yeah, no question. No question. One of the things that you mentioned a moment ago um, was, you know, about some of the adaptive capabilities uh, on the MFA side and adaptive and, and risk-based authentication has kind of been around for, at least for a, a little while now. Um, what are you seeing from customers uh, in terms of, you know, the value that they're getting from the adaptive functionality and, and what signals are they getting the most value from? Yeah, so the, uh, you know, the adaptive MFA functionality, I think the, the thing that companies like about it a lot is that they're beginning to get the possibilities of really only challenging users for multi-factor authentication when it's absolutely required, right? When, when you have those higher risk scenarios that are, that are coming into play. And so it's, it's a lot less evasive of a rollout for multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, you, you have algorithms that are in place that are looking at those signals like you mentioned, you know, so with Okta, you're looking at location, you're looking at the IP address, um, and you're looking at the type of device that, that the user is using, and you're able to, to take all those together and, and ascertain whether this is a higher risk type situation. Um, and, uh, you know, for what I've seen, I think location obviously is, uh, is a big one. Um, if, uh, you know, on-premise versus off-premise is, is obviously a big deal for, for a lot of companies as to whether or not they're going to trust or not. If it's on their own network, they're far more willing to trust it. If it's off-network, you know, they, it's a little bit more suspicious. Um, but also the device, you know, has this user been here before? Has he used this device before? Um, that, that helps gain confidence as to whether or not it's really the same person or not. Yeah, that, that paired with, you know, the presence of device certificates, uh, to basically uh, the amalgamation of all of those signals to determine access decisions, I think is going to be going to be a pretty critical path forward. Um, you know, and, and I think customers are having a lot of success with that. But uh, two last things that I wanted to talk to you about that are more um, security landscape centric, at least as it pertains to the adaptive MFA functionality. Uh, one of those things is, you know, the different types of factors and the strength of those factors. And, you know, uh, I think everyone is pretty well uh, familiar with this idea that uh, not all of these uh, second factor uh, 
experiences are created equal. Um, what, what would you say that you're seeing in terms of uh, customer deployment, customer awareness, in terms of you know SMS perhaps not being such a good factor compared to say uh, a U2F token um, or uh, OctaVerify Verify push as an example? Yeah, so um, that's it's a really good question and. Uh, you have to really kind of take a look at the different requirements and different aspects of, of what the customer is trying to accomplish in order to make some of those best case recommendations for them. When you're looking at what Okta offers today from a security factor standpoint, we have a range of offerings, security questions, SMS, voice call, email, software, physical OTPs, um, push verification, YubiKey, UTF, and Windows Hello. Um, but that's quite a lot to, to bite off when you're looking at it and you're going, well, which one am I actually going to make available to my, uh, to my end users? Uh, to make that decision, I find that you really have to try to take a look at different factors on the business criteria standpoint, uh, costs, security, deployability, and usability really kind of all stand out together. Um, you know, typically you might be um, looking at something like SMS and uh, voice calls, they're a little bit uh, less costly, they're easy to deploy, um, and they have a generally good user experience that users kind of understand how to use them um, and, and not likely to have uh, you know lost them per se. But uh, on the other hand, you have something like a, a physical um, OTP or YubiKey, which brings that stronger security, more reliance on it. Um, but it might be a little bit more costly to deploy. It might be a little bit uh, more difficult to use. You have to remember to have that with you. And so it might cause a little bit more friction with your end users. And so you kind of have to balance those and, and kind of make that uh, decision was which, which is right for you based on those factors. That makes a lot of sense. And, and one of the other things that I hear a lot of, uh, as a part of like our product interviews um, is just in general, like using our policy framework to determine what is the risk posture that you want to have for different types of users across your organization seems to also be a big path. Um, in other words, just thinking through this idea that perhaps administrative staff that doesn't necessarily have a lot of access to sensitive data, maybe you're willing to use a, a lower level assurance factor with that user versus an executive um, who might have the keys to the castle and maybe you do something which will, like maybe you force them to use a YubiKey as an example, which you know, you know, forces them to you know carry something around in their pocket as an example, um, but maybe you require that as just like your risk tolerance for those different types of users. Yeah, yeah, and that's actually something that gets me really excited about what Okta has to offer here because you can define different policies. Um, you can define uh, different uh, security postures, like you said, where um, you know admins fall under one category, the everyday user from home falls under another. Uh, you know, a help desk agent is going to have a whole different uh, aspect, and so you can kind of maybe in some cases prompt users on every login to, to have to do an MFA and in other cases they never have to MFA and in right. other use cases it's on a per application basis and uh, you can kind of mix and match and do it all. So it's not, it doesn't have to be a one size fits all uh, decision when it comes to that. Yeah, no question. And that's one of the things that excites me as well is like, I've never been at a security company that, you know, had a product that didn't completely ruin user experience. And I actually think what Okta does uh, from an end user point of view is more about enabling end users to do their jobs as opposed to disabling them, which I, I think is you know, a huge boon for how you use uh, identity solutions. Right, yeah, and then that goes back to that zero trust network and, and uh, kind of that old school thinking of, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have security by blocking you from getting in versus we're going to let you in, but then we're going to block you when necessary. Right, that makes sense, and and I think this is this is kind of like a, a good segue to the next topic, which is really focused on on the promises um, and the potential upside, especially over time, moving into the future, as you know, organizations have, have uh, and vendors have a better ideas in terms of how they're going to use this technology. But what are you thinking about, and what are you hearing of in terms of the intersection of identity and AMFA with machine learning? What, what do you what does that look like, and what do you think? What's your perspective on the upside there? Yeah, you know, I, certainly I think this is the next big thing in multi-factor authentication. Um, monitoring more and more points of, uh, and storing them in massive data lakes where they can be mined for behavioral patterns using machine learning. 
uh, that can determine better uh, risk levels and can do it on every page click and not just when the user signs in. And I'm pretty certain this is something that you and your team um, is looking at all the time. Kind of where do you see this all heading, Joe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is a big part of our, our decision making in the future. Again, like you've like you've spoken to quite a bit is like for us, this is all about thinking through, well, what are the different risk signals that actually extract value? What are the behaviors that people care about? How can you balance this idea of uh, enabling organizations to create policies and risk based policies in terms of what it is that they're actually looking for based on their own organization, organizational rules? Um, how do you balance that with creating a black box of, of uh, a framework on the back end that people don't necessarily understand the output of. And um, so those are the two things that we're, we're actually trying to make sure that we balance really well is because, you know, some of the, some of the approaches of yesteryear are really focused on having these algorithms on the back end, these, uh, these machine learning elements that were kind of working on the back end and you had no idea how well they were working. Um, you had no idea if they're even adding value. Um, they were just kind of in the back there. Right. So it's, right. it's going to be a really big balance act in the future from a product design point of view to make sure that you deliver functionality that is defensively adding value and not creating noise or false positives. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's going to be a, a, a strong uh, initiative ahead for, I think, for everybody to do that. Right. No, there's no question. Uh, we, there's a bunch of obviously very interesting functionality um, that I think we're going to see out of the identity and access management layer in general. And, and machine learning is, is going to be a critical path of that. Um, obviously, you see kind of the emerging notions and trends of where blockchain might sit from an identity point of view as well. Um, getting better at continuous authentication. Um, just looking for signals. Obviously, you see a wealth of data as kind of that when you're sitting at that identity layer. How do you blend all these things together to um, add value automatically, provide orchestration capabilities, but at the same time, provide enough flexibility uh, to actually do this from a policy-based point of view as well? Uh, so with that, Dave, um, I, I think we're up on time here. So I just want to, you know, thank you for for taking the time to to, to talk today. Um, always a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, look forward to doing it again. And uh, to all of our audiences, uh, I just want to thank you for joining us. And we will be, be doing more uh, episodes of this uh, of the Meet Your Octa Identity Expert. So with that, thanks again, Dave. Uh, thank you. It's been great to be here. Pleasure. Take care. Bye.